Hi, I'm Tracy Fullerton with USC Games, and you're listening to the Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. I'm your host, Ben Mattis. Today's guest is Tracy Fullerton of the USC Game Innovation Lab, where she's she's been at USC for 20 some years now and helped kind of co-found the game design curriculum there. This is a really interesting conversation if you have any interest in the difference between academia and industry, how they operate differently, why they operate differently, how they measure differently versus the kinds of metrics that we use in, in you know, modern professional game development, but also how much is similar and how much the modern game development industry owes to academia and the curriculum of these programs. Tracy was absolutely passionately enthusiastic. We spoke for an hour. It went by like that. We could have gone on for twice as long. But if you have any interest in anything to do with how game design is taught, how the game designers of tomorrow are trained today, the explosion of indie game development, the explosion of digital distribution, I think you'll find today's conversation with Tracy Fullerton really insightful. I hope you enjoy. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, uh, great to see you again, uh, Tracy. Thanks for, yeah, thanks great for to joining. See you too. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Actually, I, sh- I should probably tell the story, right, that we had started this But we got interrupted because my six-year-old, who's just made the switch from Minecraft Bedrock to Minecraft Minecraft Java Edition, needed to come upstairs and ask for help. That was a a great start. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's great when you have a dad who can help you with these things, right? Honestly, he's going to blow me out of the water within, within two years, I'm sure. He's six years old, and he's literally... Uh, wants Java edition because he wants to be able to do mods and console commands and like and he's like t- the command blocks of of Bedrock edition were like too limiting to him and he wants to like actually do like like development and like code in JSON and like the whole nine yards and he's I six years it. old it's I unbelievable it. it reminds me of when I was a kid and my uh, grand my grandfather bought me a Vic twenty a Commodore Vic twenty. Um, and within a week, I was like, Grandpa, it's just not enough. We need to get the the 64, the Commodore yeah. 6. We have to have that, yeah. you know, and we have to have the tape drive because yeah. otherwise we can't store the programs. That's right. <laughs> what is this? What is this garbage you got me? We need to upgrade. The treadmill started really early for you. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, well, uh, Tracy, listen, uh, it's, I'm really looking forward to this chat. We've only just met a couple of months ago. Um, since then, you've had a much needed break. Um, you're, you're back in the saddle now, and I really appreciate you taking the time um, to be on this podcast. Uh, I thought it would make sense to open up with an introduction, right? The, the, the softball. So if, if, if you can introduce yourself, explain a little bit about um, your kind of career and what it is you do. And then that'll help me frame, you know, the context of the rest of this conversation for the listeners. Sure thing. Uh, Yeah, so I am a professor at USC Games, and I run a research lab at that program called the Game Innovation Lab. And so in addition to teaching, uh, I also uh, do experimental games research uh, in my lab. Um, where we're really looking to do uh, work that pushes the boundaries of what games can be thought of, what they do, uh, where you might see them in, in culture, in things like education or politics or uh, medicine or, you know, in the arts. Uh, there's so many places that I think uh, games and play uh, can be can play a part. Especially, Absolutely. and and so in the lab, that's that's a lot of what we do. Uh, my my background is that I, I I come from industry. I was in the game industry for for many years since the um, early nineties. I was trying to count back there. That's many years. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, you know, I I had my own company for a time and uh, worked with a lot of companies like Microsoft and Sony to develop some early cutting edge. Uh, multiplayer games, um, uh, MTV to develop some some uh, interactive television games and and so forth and and uh, really sort of was always on the 
the edge, I think, uh, kind of five to 10 years out. Okay. And at a certain point, I, I really realized that um, what I wanted to do was actually help develop the industry and push it forward. And it seemed a real fit for me okay. uh, to, to, to be in academia. So, okay, so well, that was my second question, which was what motivated the transition from industry to academia? But when did that happen? Like, how long have you been at USC? So um, first thing I would say is I've actually been teaching since, since almost the beginning of my career. I would, I would do part-time teaching at night, um, which was great. And it helped me develop a lot of um, techniques for, for teaching people how to design games. Okay. Um, so I was a part-time teacher, and um, in 2001, I, as I mentioned, I had a company as a startup. We were venture-backed, and um, 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the games that we were making were part of marketing programs for television um, shows, like The Weakest Link, and I uh, was just trying to remember right now all the shows. Uh, anyways, working for the Game Show Network and the WB and uh, MTV and a bunch of other folks. And, and the games we were making were sort of on the marketing budgets. And um, I don't even remember, but the kind of that, that industry tanked, the, yes. the kind of advertising uh, yeah. industry tanked uh, around that time. And so it really was a strain on a, on a small company. We had a lot of innovative technologies. We were, you know, winning awards for our games and, uh, you know, had millions of people tuning in every night to play alongside these um, these television game shows. Uh, but first of all, it wasn't that creatively satisfying for me. And second of all, uh, you know, like I say, the market tanked. So then there was, a, I, I really, uh, I just got in my car, my, my SUV, and I drove around the country. Hmm. It was kind of soul searching. And I thought about what I enjoyed. What, what, you know, like I certainly didn't enjoy, to be honest, they were great people, but I didn't enjoy working with the VCs. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're great. It wasn't my thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, I didn't enjoy really all the money and management so much. Um, I really just, you know, enjoyed making. And I realized that I enjoyed that one day a week that I would go down to USC and teach, and, and teach at night. Um, and I loved the innovation that the students naturally brought to their, to their ideas. And I just thought, you know, that lights me up. And I think maybe I should sort of tend toward that. Okay. So, so I, you know, went to the folks at USC and sort of said, hey, you know, I'd like to do this full time uh, if there's a place. And they're like, well, we kind of, you know, we don't have one right now, but we'd love to, to grow this, you know, these, this set of electives we have around games. And um, they had just actually decided to start the program. Okay. And so uh, I kind of wrote up this proposal for um, this idea of, to build this game innovation lab and this this I, this games program um, in a lot of ways to give myself a job, but also right. because I really had a vision for how innovation could be done in a university setting. Okay, um, and we just out of luck talked to the folks at Electronic Arts, and um, they were like, "Yeah, this is really a great idea." And they funded the first iteration of our program and um, founded the Game Innovation Lab. Uh, uh, and so that was kind of how the move happened. Wow. Okay. I mean, so definitely a um, sort of aligning of the stars, though, as well, where by your interest was right at the right time where the USC was sort of saying, hmm, we've got all these electives, let's try and coalesce these into a thing. And then you happened to come along. So... Um, Fate, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, fate is what you make it, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> fate that you, <laughs> fate that you made happen. So not fate. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have this funny question here, and uh, I just assumed that this commercial was was universally just hated in the gaming industry. And I sent it to you and you're sort of like, oh, I'd never seen this thing before. But, but for me, this commercial was like everyone, I mean, I was at Ubisoft at the time when this thing came out. And this, it was like total meme fodder where we would send this commercial around and we'd all just laugh and be like, oh, so it looks like that's how we make games. Like clearly we don't know what we're doing because we're supposed to just sit in a big room in these big comfy chairs and sort of say, let's put a sound effect here and then like the game gets made so it was just I this, watched it yeah. I watched it the, what you sent me but I think it I really I looked it up it came out in 2007 which was yeah. around the time that we were just just blowing up 
um, yeah. in terms and in terms of the program and the lab and things that were coming out of the lab and and also it, it was a television commercial. Yes. So I'm going to just confess that you know post my uh, Spider Dance experiences, which was the company that made interactive television games. Yeah, you um, didn't have long I to do with I television. Didn't, I didn't watch a lot of television <laughs> okay. in those days. I was like you know having too much fun, yeah. you know, build, <laughs> building games and being in the games program. <laughs> What we're, just for the listeners here, we're referring to this uh, Collins College commercial, which, as Tracy (laughs) said, came out in around 2007, and it was an advertisement for a game designer curriculum at this (laughs) educational institute called Collins College. I have no idea how serious an educational institute they might be, Um, but it was definitely, it was a bit of a joke inside the industry, and and. And the question that I'm, I'm, I'm looking for here is that sometime probably prior to 2001, there was some sort of relationship between industry and academia. And then there was this evolution point, I would guess, around 2001, right? And there's been a series of these evolution points in the last 25 years. And as someone who's now been in academia for 20 years, but who had been in industry for some years before that. I'm wondering if you can sort of outline for us some of the the, the milestones, if you will, on in, in, in the relationship between industry and academia as it's sure. evolved. Sure. And I and I think it's important to look all the way back to the earliest days yeah. of uh digital games and remember that things like Space War, you know, came out of MIT, came out of their uh model railroad club. They were, you know, doing research uh uh to advance the, you know, uh I think it was the deck computers uh, that ha- had been given to them to uh, to, to do work on. So there's a, a deep connection between the earliest days of the industry, um, the very, you know, sort of the very glint in the eye of people thinking Absolutely. about it. it could be an industry and, and academia and, and, and specifically academic research. Um, so, so I, so that aside, uh, I think that, you know, the industry uh, kind of grew up, like a wild west, right? Mm-hmm. And it, a lot of the folks who are in industry were either dropouts from from school or okay. um, that it was that wasn't their thing, right? Yeah. Um. So we had a lot of time where things evolved where there wasn't a, a strong connection between yeah. academia, especially higher education, and um and industry. And that's that's cool. That was like that was just a the kind of way things uh, worked out, and people were more interested in being entrepreneurs and et cetera. Uh, I think that, you know, in the late uh, 1990s, there's a group of people, including myself, who start um, teaching electives in different kinds of programs all over the, the co- I'm going to just sp- s- stick to North America, which I know yeah, that's best. fine. Yeah. Um, all over the country, right? You, so you have people who are in maybe like um, computing, creative computing or, or media arts or, mm-hmm, you know, yeah. sort of. There's this sort of, um, you know, CD-ROM slash builder type programs, you know, uh, like uh, I want to say ITP at uh, at NYU, et cetera. Um, and lots of computer, uh, you know, sort of uh, programming uh, courses started to kind of think about games, okay. um, right? Um, but there was no real programs uh there wasn't there wasn't really a, a, f- a full program uh, actually in europe uh there was a program in copenhagen uh oh, that was early one uh but uh y- there wasn't a lot and it was not valued in fact um when i started teaching games i can remember having conversation with people uh including will wright who very you know sincerely nicely asked me um but do you think you can really teach people how to design games mm-hmm um, it, there was this assumption that um, it was a kind of God-given gift, like uh, you know. But I sort of thought of it as more so let's like be clean- clear. This this predated Will Wright's master class by by a couple of decades, right? Oh, so clearly yeah. he's clearly he's had a change of heart. <laughs> it was just, and I don't think Will was actually. I think the way Will learns, he asks questions. So I don't think yeah. he was actually saying you can't. Yeah, uh, a lot of other people said you can't, but I think Will was more like do you think you really can? And like wondering, okay, what are the, let's deconstruct that. How do you yeah. do it? That So um, yeah, no, I'm not, not saying Will doesn't believe in it because he, he certainly is a, a master of learning and, and play. 
Um, yeah, indeed. So, um, but yes, yeah, early on, you really, people thought you couldn't. And um, there were those of us in these, these classes developing techniques. And I think I mentioned that, that um, we started thinking about how do you teach people? I mean, how do you teach people how to play piano? How do you teach people how to draw? How do you teach people how to do anything that mm-hmm. is both um, based in a kind of innate artistic yeah. ability, but also a kind of uh, t- craft and technique, right? With so the there's process, a, there's a yeah. real integration, right? And so started thinking about that, started teaching it, tar- started teaching it more and more seriously. Um, and I actually, you know, started collecting notes for a book that um, eventually be published in 2004 um, called Game Design Workshop, uh, where we walk through the steps of pro- you know, coming up with a concept, setting experience goals, uh, prototyping, play testing, iterating, and uh, then going into a, a full development, but really focusing in on the ideation and the concept and the prototyping uh, cycle, which I call the play-centric method because it involves playing the game with with players. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so these methods started to become real, and I think that you know we started uh, the games program started realizing that there was uh, you know something to be done here. There was a there was almost a domain to be built, okay. right? And so around uh, I guess two thousand one or two was when. Well, actually, we would have written it earlier. So we wrote the proposal for the program to start. Right. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing about our program, as opposed to a lot of the other electives I was just talking about, is it took place in uh, the, play, the classes were taught in the School of Cinematic Arts, and we were teaching games as an expressive medium. Right. Um, and as I mentioned, there's, there were other places that games were being taught, say, in, um, uh, say, critical theory er- areas where you're critiquing games. There were places in computer science where they're teaching more about like game engines oh, no, and yeah. things like that. Uh, but what we were trying to do is create um, a method for educating people to be um, really strong, creative game designers. And um, that was, I think, the big difference for our program. Um, and so we began by looking at similar types of media that mm-hmm. were teaching really well. Mm-hmm. And we were sitting in a school of cinematic arts, which is right. famous for creating yeah. um, amazing media makers. And I was, I'm actually just, you know, full disclosure, a graduate of that, of that school. So I knew their curriculum. I knew how they um, scaffold you through the learning process. And we basically built the first draft of our curriculum uh, to do that, to begin with fundamentals, paper prototyping, and also develop the fundamentals to build on um, teamwork in the sort of intermediate step and then to advance teamwork where you have much larger teams in our, our advanced uh, game studio. So that's, you know, the first iteration of games programs, I would say, was split. And it was split a lot by domain. Mm-hmm. Where you started yeah. uh, really when, determined what the focus you of your program. A program or whatnot, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, still... I think that uh, there was a lot of skepticism in the game industry about, well, you know, why would I hire someone from a game school when I've done so well just hiring people from just straight up computer Mm -hmm. science or straight up arts, right? And then 2006. 2006 was a big year for academic programs and also for indie games, um, which sort of grew up together in a way, I would argue. Uh, this 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 era of indie games grew up together. In 2006, uh, we from the Game Innovation Lab we launched Cloud, mm-hmm. and um, there were uh, oh Narbo- Narbocular Drop, uh, the folks who would go on to build Portal. Yeah. That was their student game, um, and uh, a bunch of other games were all at this one show in. Um, uh, at Sundance, but it's called, what's it called? It's now I'm going to, I'm going to blank on it. It's, it's the alter ego. It's the kind of punk indie alter ego of, um, of, uh, of that film, of that f- film festival. Not South by Southwest. Yeah, I, no. no, no, no. And I'll, I'll blank on it. Sam okay. Roberts is going to kill me when, when he hears this. But, um, but anyways, there was like kind of underground games festival. Okay. Um, that was associated with the underground um, film festival yeah. at Sundance. So we okay. were all a bunch of game jerks sitting around 
in Sundance with all the ritzy people in this tiny little room, like sweaty little room showing off our games. And um, everyone met each other. And it was like there was this tremendous energy. And uh, I, I remember that out of that and out of the success of uh, groups uh, like the Narbacular uh, Drop group and like the, uh, like the Cloud team, who, of course, went on to, to do Flow and, yeah. and et cetera, and become that, that game company. So out of those, those early meetings and teams, uh, there was just something that clicked that said, uh, you know, we can't make AAA games in schools. Mm-hmm. We, we're n- not going to compete and we are not going to, you know, it's not even a, it's not a great idea. You have to remember at that time, things like the IGF were around, but what they really were was a bunch of showcasing of wannabe AAA games on yeah. teeny tiny budgets, yeah. right? But what we did was we said, well, let's not do that. Mm-hmm. Let's actually take the skills our students have, which is they they can blue sky think and they can come up with these wacky ideas and let's lean into that and make these small, tight, polished, heartfelt games, right? Like uh, that, that could make a difference. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was, you know, sort of the, in, in a way, the marketing niche that we've figured out um, for, for student indies, right? And it really worked and it got a lot. I mean, when we, when we put cloud up um, in those early days, we had no idea what we were doing. We had it on somebody, one of the students' servers at first. We just like didn't know. And I went out and gave a talk about it, got written about in some international journal. <laughs> and like, you know, 10,000 people hit us in one day. And, and the, the hosting company sent us like a, a bill. I don't even know. It was some, it was some huge amount. We were like, uh, what? <laughs> we're not ready for this. <laughs> and so we panicked and we, we first we said, get it on the USC servers, quick, quick, quick. And we put it on the USC servers. And then the USC folks came, the IT folks were like, you can't have this here. They're using up all our bandwidth, you know? And, and then, so we're like, oh, let's get EA. And we're like, please, can you host our game? <laughs> Cause we didn't know that people would like it. I mean, we literally just put it up there and we're like, you know, five people are going to come get it, right? Yeah. And that was not the case. It just kind, it just got uh, picked up, you know, virally. And uh, so EA actually hosted it for a very, very long time. In fact, awesome. as far as I know, they may still have the executables on their drives. Now. I guess that's a I definition of a good problem to have. <laughs> that's exactly what Bing Gordon said. Yeah. Um, it's 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 hilarious because. Um, I don't know if you know Bing, but uh, he was one of the co-founders of, of EA. And, and, Known by uh, name, for sure. Yeah, so Bing is a... He was one of the fa- he, people who came in with EA and founded the the USC Games program okay, cool. and had always been a mentor. And he mentored us Wonderful. during the cloud production. And I remember him coming in and just not getting the game at first. He was sort of like... He's so, he's so straightforward with his critique. And he was like, so you guys need some enemy clouds in here, you know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this, this, and it was like, oh, we don't, that's not kind of the kind of that's game we're not making. What we're making, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. And, uh, um, but then he had, he, he, he had some really good advice about point of view and the camera and like how it should feel. Cool. And, uh, later on when it, you know, had, I don't even know how many downloads, I swear to God, it might, like, it was so many, it was like hundreds of thousands. He was like, well, he's like, that's how you measure success. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's the new yardstick. Um, yeah, but so that was a real turning point, I think, so, because what so happened the, was a lot, of, a lot of games programs looked at that. Right, and then they saw a, a model. They saw a, a, model. They saw a, a, a yardstick of success and said, now we, know what, now we know what is possible. We have a sense of what to measure up against. And to be fair, they were teaching great game design but what nobody ever did, I noticed, was finish their games. Yeah. And that's what we did. We polished it up. We finished it. We made marketing materials and a little, back then, we made a little DVD that, you yeah. know. More than just a prototype. Finished it up, right? Yeah. yeah. So 20, 2001 was a big date. 2006 was a big date. Have there been other big dates since, or are we still in the post-2006 era and, 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 you know, sort of architecturally things have stayed more or less the same since that, you know, watershed moment? Well, I think 
it, I'm, I'm not certain that I would call them big dates, but I will tell you, and, and everyone has progressed. Uh, it's really interesting how, how different programs have progressed, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you, because they're not all in the same timeline, right? Mm -hmm. There's like first wave, second wave, third wave, uh, et cetera. Um, and I would say that our program is the first wave. Mm -hmm. um, and what you see as these programs do finish their games, as they do start building teams and making more advanced projects, then you see a series of things happening. First and foremost, you see the evolution of the, um, the final shows, mm -hmm. right? So bringing together uh, lots of people to see these, these student games. And you see the evolution of student um, areas in major games festivals. Yeah. Um, so, so, so what happens is the next step is really the wider recognition yeah. and the wider visibility of these student games. Um, and along with that comes, it, you know, if we look at the, the, the period of history, you see digital distribution. Yeah. is matched up almost in like almost directly with the wider visibility of students and indie games, right? Um, so just as an example, the folks who made cloud, you know, we didn't know anyone was going to come and get it. <clears throat> we were really naive. And in that day we were making DVDs for the for the game, right? Um, but then you jump a couple of years forward and you have the introduction of PlayStation Network. Mm -hmm. And I'll just Journey. keep using that game company as an example because they were sort of riding the front wave, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, you know, we were able to help them um, sign a three-game deal, you know? It's like almost in the same vein as like a director coming out and getting a three-picture deal. So these these folks came out and were able to form their company and, and set up a three-game deal with Sony <clears throat> to publish uh, uh, their indie games. And the whole trick to that was it was because Sony was launching the network, the PlayStation Network, and they needed, uh, at that time, it's interesting because all the AAA, all their big partners were not going to no, turn the ship yeah. and make small downloadable games yeah. and re ready for launch. So they absolutely needed content for the launch of the PlayStation Network, right? Um, and so they took a couple of select games, things like Flow and Everyday Shooter um, as examples, and they they made these you know deals with these indie developers. And it just so happened that uh, Arsons were sitting right at the right place at the right time to cool. be to make this this three game deal. You know, so, so visibility, yeah, starts being a thing. So okay, so then all right, so. I think that's a really interesting point about the sort of like what came first. It's almost like they they re, they needed each other. Digital distribution needed indie games to take off. Indie games needed digital distribution in order to have widespread discovery. And now we are in this, I guess, third wave era, right? Where you know a a, a, a student group who's polished their game can theoretically have well, first of all, they have engine choice in order to help them make that game. They have educational programs like USC and the Innovation Lab in order to help them find the teams to make these things. But then they have these, these, these platforms, you know, a plethora of platforms that they can hypothetically choose from in order to commercialize these products. So there's, it, it is a very different era today than it was, you know, even 10 it years is. ago. I mean, if, if I think back, you know, I mean, cloud was on a homegrown engine, yeah. right? Um, and the original student game of Flow uh, uh, was on Flash. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, flash. So, yeah, on Flash, exactly. Uh, but you're right. So that's another big thing, not only digital distribution, but of course, the proliferation of easy to get, easy to use tools. Yeah. Um, yeah. And specifically tools that were platform agnostic. Yeah. Right. So that was critical. Um, and I think as we all know, um, up to the game of the indie uh, uh, sort of creative Usually, output. Absolutely. And, and within academia, it meant that not only people in those games programs, but interestingly enough, people in other domains, right? So people in the uh, medical schools doing mm -hmm. research in behavioral change, people in architecture, pe you know, uh, people in... in um, you know, the film school doing pre-visualization. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, of 
innovation happening on the outskirts of even the sort of core game programs. And but it's I think all that with these engines <laughs> ex- exactly, but it means that creatives can tr- can can walk across those lines, right? So we would send our kids to intern and make. Uh, games with the medical school and cool. um, s- send them all over the campus. And uh, I think that's, these are some really interesting experiences, right? So we've talked a lot about the, the framework of these curriculums. But one of the things that really interests me is someone like you who spent 20 some years now inside, effectively inside the indie space, right? Seeing hundreds, thousands of games being created um, across every platform, you know, almost. I just had a Carl end. Sagan-like moment. When, when you said, <laughs> billions and, and <laughs> billions and billions. Exactly. Um, oh, Carl. I love Carl. Um, so I'm wondering if there are trends that you've seen specifically to content. Like, obviously, there are trends in terms of technology and engines and distribution and, you know, that kind of thing. But are there genres or types of games that you've seen come and go or that you've seen sort of get created or born out of, for example, the USC Games Innovation Lab that then sort of took hold and and, and grew from there? Yeah, I don't think it's local to us. I think, though, that um, one of the really interesting uh, types of games that, you know, we've seen grow would be personal games, okay. right? So when I'm saying that, I mean games that are talking about and using the medium of games to, to explore uh, very personal ideas and experiences. Um, and I, I find that, that to fascinating because I don't think, I don't believe that that is possible without the proliferation of these tools, right? right? With uh, so these games would range on everything from Twine uh, to, you know, RPG Game Maker or to, um, you know, obviously to things, um, uh, you know, to higher end platforms. Unity or Unreal um, or whatever. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, I mean, even more leaning towards things like Twine, though, I would mm-hmm. say. Um, and this makes possible a whole new type of game designer, mm-hmm. right? Um, one of the things I would just back up and say that from the earliest days in our program, we've actually tried to admit a cohort that is uh, not just, um, you know, technical or artistic. Right. We try to admit across a spectrum of domains and backgrounds so that there will be mix, yeah. so that there will be ideas, right? And that by its nature means that there are going to be some people who are less able to get started right away, yeah. right? Because they have a lot of learning to do on the technical side. But I would argue that the technical folks generally have a lot of learning to do on the creative side, creative so side it all evens exactly. out in the yeah, end. Exactly. Yeah, but the reason I point that out is because the the sort of the introduction of tools like Twine, the introduction of kind of easy, you know, easy to ramp up. Like we actually mm-hmm. use processing um, in our uh, intro coding classes mm-hmm. because it does a really nice job of just getting for visual people, getting the concepts and showing something visual on the screen right away. You know, <laughs> there's a nice feedback loop for, for, for visual or creative folks. Uh, so we, we, you know, we use some of these lower end tools to, to ramp people up. Cool. And it also allows them to have these, these early experiences where they make games about things that are concerning. Something that means, means something to them. It's like, it's like an right. opportunity to express themselves individually through this, this, what once upon a time was the domain of a team, only the domain of a team and generally a larger team. So it was a little harder to have an individualistic message that is, exactly. is evolved. Okay, that's super cool. Exactly. And so, you know, you see the rise of, you know, games like Anth- and Anthropy's games, um, you know, um, and uh, uh, God, I'm just blanking on uh, one of my favorite Twine game makers, um, and I'm just going to have, I'm going to have senior moments all the time. Cause I don't know you, but COVID, I, <laughs> <laughs> I forget stuff all the time, all the time. Anyways, yeah. there was, there was a rise of some really great game makers, um, on these platforms and, the, and, and our students come to us cause they're inspired by those. That's and like, we want to, cool. you know, learn to make these right. Um, and yeah. So, so, so l- take any of these meaningful games, right. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Okay, so this question's going to sound weird, but Okay. <laughs> like in my in in my world, like I didn't I didn't I mean, I went to school, I got a degree in computer science, and I knew then that I wanted to work in game development, but it, it wasn't a game development curriculum. It was a computer science curriculum. And from right. the moment that I've been in the industry, there's always been that, you know, that, like what we're talking about earlier, like that yardstick, like there's always been a way to measure success. It hasn't always been the same. Like once upon a time, it was all about the Metacritic and like, oh, 89% plus and you'll get a bonus, right? Or Maybe it was just number of sales, right? And you've got the two month window before Christmas and like, that's it. You're going to do all your sales because it's a box product. And like, so we've got to sell two and a half million copies in this three month window. There's always been some sort of yardstick to measure success. These days, you know, in, in, in the mobile industry in particular, we look a lot at like retention and daily active users and all sorts of other KPIs. There's a million different KPIs that all have crazy acronyms, but there's a million different ways you can measure success of your product, mm -hmm. depending on what you're trying mm -hmm. to do. And I guess one of the questions that I have about meaningful games or serious games or personal games is what, <laughs> what is success? What is, is success? It, sure. Is it, I made someone cry? I mean, and, and obviously this is like, there's going to be a million answers to this, but what kind of success metrics have you been exposed to in your eras where a kid might say, a kid, a, a, a group of students might say, our game was a success because X. I'm really right. interested in right. how, how those success metrics, metrics might differ in, in student-led games. So that's a really broad question because actually even within what you call, you're saying, serious games. So what, what sometimes are called games for impact um, okay. these days, people I think are trying to get away from the idea of quote unquote serious games because okay. it's such a uh, oxymoron, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, so games for Seriously. impact is, is, is a phrase that a lot of people are okay. using, um, within that statement is a part of the answer, okay. right? Which is what kind How of impact, impact you want to yeah. have, right? Um, and actually Ben Stokes, uh, one of my former PhD students and, um, now a professor at American university has written extensively on how do we measure the impact of, okay. of games for impact. And it, and it's part of the design process. You will set a goal, you set your experience goals, and generally within the goals that you set will be measurable, uh, you know, uh, go measurable things that you can see, do we make it, okay. right? Now there's, that's a, that's sort of more intrinsic success. Mm -hmm. Did the player feel connected enough exactly, to like, yeah. you know, make these moral choices, you know, with a sense of, of believing in the world? Did it feel authentic, right? Um, now there's, and then there's external, um, you know, measurements, right? Mm -hmm. So did you have this many downloads? Did you mm -hmm. win any awards, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and then there's also a mixture, right? So there's, there's the design proof that you're looking for. There's the sort of market proof they're looking for. And in the middle, there's something we generally call formative and summative evaluation when we're doing these, the research on games. And formative is the kind of testing you do with players and, and stakeholders during yeah. the process okay. to feedback. Yeah. And at the end, you do summative evaluation with a third party who actually measures your goals, right? Interesting. Um, and that is, I think, one of, one of the things that's very different about um, maybe academic uh, game design research than, um, say, the kind of user research that's done in the industry. Because our goals might be wider. And mm -hmm. there's fantastic user research that's done in the industry about how to make the game, you know, run better for players, you know, be more, uh, you know, keep players coming back, mm -hmm. right, uh, et cetera, and essentially return more money on, mm -hmm. on, on the game is the, is the underlying goal. Uh, but you, to do that, you have to have more fun and more, more uh, uh, you know, engagement for players. Uh, but we might have a broader set of goals. Okay, we might actually want to change someone's behavior in terms of oh, here, here in terms of drinking water. So this right. little thing lights up when I have to drink water, right? It's like glowing at me now. That's why I'm thinking about it, right? Um, <laughs> and do you get points when you do, and do you like level up and like upgrade your character? You do. You get trophies. It's kind of <laughs> terrible. It's actually the worst. The worst. It's the worst because you you have essentially. I, I hate this word. You have gamified, gamified water drinking. Yeah. And yet for those of us who sit at our desk all day and forget to drink water, it, it's actually life-saving. Yeah. Um, 
I'm looking around. I don't have a water glass in front of me, so clearly I've just lost the game of five version of water drinking. I, I have to start over. I'm level zero. Level zero. Yeah. I'm. I yeah. I, and then you can compete with your friends, see how much water you drink and that's stuff. Right. It's ridiculous, but it's great. It works for me. I, for whatever reason, it works for me. Um, that's not necessarily what I mean when I think of behavior yeah. change in games. Obviously, I think that games are much more complex and much more interesting than mm-hmm. a gamified system. Okay. Um, and, and they can create worlds where we imagine ourselves differently mm-hmm. and that, that will drive that behavior change in a much more meaningful way. In the same way, by the way, that a lot of media has done throughout the years. Absolutely. Many books have inspired people to change their lives and their behavior and change their thinking. Um, many films have inspired people, you know, that media is a lens to our, to, ref, you know, that basically reflects our own aspirations on us, right? Can, can you call out just one? Can you choose, I mean, obviously you've probably got lots, but can you choose one to share with us that was particularly impactful for you that for me either changed your own lens on life or or, or, or you know that it changed someone's lens on life in a really impactful way and, and, and that then stuck with you. Well, I'll go right back to one of the earliest quote unquote serious games that I played um, as a young person. And that was called Balance of Power. It was a game by Chris Crawford. I don't okay. know if you recall it. I mean, I know um, Chris Crawford, but I don't think I ever played Balance of Power. Well, it's a simulation game uh, where you play as either the United States or the USSR. And you are trying to keep the world from falling into nuclear, nuclear war. war. Okay. And there's a tr- ton of different act- actions you can take and sort of parameters that you're keeping an eye on and as the tensions escalate. And then, you know, there's obviously the AI is sending you problems to solve, right? Um, but that game almost always ended up in um, a nuclear attack on one side or <laughs> the other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's like this little picture and it's like, you have, you know, uh, you've destroyed the world. Um, and I played that game over and over and over again. Um, as a Cold War kid, um, it was really impactful to me mm. because I began to see the, you know, the sort of zero sum aspect of the um, way that, that, you know, sort of our politics and their, so the way that the world was sort of teetering. Right. Right. Um, and it really, in many ways, it, it defined how I thought about the Cold War. Okay. Right. That's amazing. Um, yeah. And, and it stuck with me ever since. And I think that the fact that it stuck with me was one of the reasons I became so interested, um, you know, in moving out of just moving out of doing games that I thought were maybe a little bit more like, um, uh, ephemeral, you know, sort of, uh, cotton candy. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and moving into games where I, I really wanted to have games that had that impact, like that impact that, that, was on me uh i would like to make a game that would have that kind of impact on on change someone's life cool yeah exactly so that's one of the reasons for starting the game innovation lab was to in many ways turn you know give me a space where i could start to play with bigger ideas you know i mean oh god okay i'm trying to think of where to go we could continue to dig into um, the innovation lab. And I, I have other questions about that, but okay. I'm going to put a pin in that. We might have to come back to this another day. I I have other questions I want to ask about that, but let's, let's shift gears for a second and let's talk about, uh, the process of game design. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and let's go back to sort of Will Wright's question, right? Like, can you teach game design? Clearly the answer is yes. Um, and I'm wondering if you can comment at a high level, you know, clearly our audience are not all game designers and they're not all planning to be game designers, but at a high level, can you talk a little bit about sort of how game design was taught then versus now, or, or like what's different about today where game design is taught versus e oldie days where it wasn't <laughs> taught or it wasn't taught well. What are some of the changes that have happened whereby game design is now right. a teachable subject? Well, first, I think it's interesting that the phrase game design is used so ubiquitously now because remember that in ye olden days, we just made games. Uh, we just had an idea for a game and we just made it. 
right? And generally, um, if you went to work in a studio, the studio had a particular genre of game that they made, Mm -hmm. and they had their probably like their own in-house proprietary engine that you learned, and it made that kind of game. And so by kind of being, by learning their engine, you sort of learned how their games worked, and then eventually you sort of started making games like theirs, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And that was, uh, I think... It was a kind of a uh, mentorship model, uh, you know, similar to a crafts, like a, a craftsman, right. you know, going in and learning how to make pots, right? You make or pots sushi. like, yeah, sushi, exactly. Spend 10 years <laughs> making rice, then we'll let you, uh, then you know, we'll whatever. Make, yeah. Let you make the sushi, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and, and that, w- that worked fine. Now, once you get, um, I guess, you know, uh, people, I suppose of my generation started poking the bear and mm-hmm. we wanted to... Uh, from the outset, make a different different okay. kinds of games about different kinds of ideas, and we wanted a different kind of process, right? Now we knew we couldn't make digital versions of every idea we had because it's too too costly, right? So we started thinking about um, low cost, fast, and flexible ways of testing ideas, yeah. right? So if you you know came up with an idea for a narrative game, hey, boom, let's make a set of cards and pretend this is the AI. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And we'll only prototype the parts of it that we need. Like we know you can walk around a world. Fine. That's proven. So let's just not prototype that. Let's only prototype the part that we have questions about. Right. So we started building these fast and flexible ways of of designing intentionally. And that's really important. So in my book, I talk about play centric design. And the one of the most important parts of a play centric design process is the intention that you have. So setting these experience goals and designing to them, Mm -hmm. not just throwing crap at a wall and seeing what's fun, having a goal and designing to it, and then testing to see if you've met the goal. Now, sometimes you come up with ideas that are great, that don't meet the goal. And then you can either change your goal or Mm -hmm. put that, you know, put a pin in that for later. Right. Um, And say, Ooh, this could meet a different goal. Right. Building this intentional design process, and in the process of doing that for ourselves, um, we began to see that the you know this kind of the, there was a process. And so, when I was a young designer, I worked uh, at a company called uh, RGA um, in in uh, Manhattan. I worked with people like Eric Zimmerman and Frank Lance, um, and we did a lot of this. We did a lot of paper prototyping and designing uh, in this sort of play centric method, um, and so you know, we all actually started teaching. Mm. And um, when we did, we, of course, introduced these methods to our students. Um, And then, as I mentioned, um, in 2004, I published the first first edition of Game Design Workshop, um, which essentially lays out for people who couldn't come to USC. I mean, my always thought was, well, USC is like expensive, right? So I should write a book so that like every kid, every kid, every kid can, can get a USC degree. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, laid out the process of, of designing your first game using this, this method. And in the, the interesting thing about trying to teach someone your own method is that, um, you learn that, that you learn more about it. You actually have to break it down. It's like tr- trying to teach someone how to tie shoes. You're like, okay, wait a minute. How do I tie shoes? I know I can do it, but can I explain it? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And that's the process of teaching. You know, that's how you break it down, the seemingly mysterious quality that some people have to design play. You can break it down into a process. Now, I will say the caveat, some people are just better at it than others. I mean, it's like piano. You can teach everyone to play, but not everyone's going to be a virtuoso, right? Um, And that, that, that is, that is, I've see, seen that, and that is true. There are people who are very gifted in the way that they think about um, making experiences for others. Mm-hmm. Often, there are people who are very um, empathetic, mm-hmm. right? So they can project um, uh, into what other people need or are looking for or 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 want to do in a particular situation. Um, and they're often very playful people themselves, right? Um, so they will have a spirit of 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 play that will you know, sort of generate others um, wanting to play. Hmm. So, you know, basically breaking down that early system for wanting to make games more than just production. Yeah. Right. Wanting to design things that are more than just producing existing genres, breaking out of 
expected design patterns was the beginnings of how we built the curriculum um, to design to de- design you know teach people to be designers. One of the interesting things that um, I'll just keep um, you know name dropping Bing, but one of the interesting things that Bing said to me when we were starting the program was that his desire was to cut the first five years um, of, of their, rice making. Of yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to cut the first five years. They only have to years. spend five years making rice now. They exactly. don't have to do the full 10. <laughs> exactly. He's like, you know, we hire people out of programs that are, you know, they're not really games-based, but they're like, we hire people out of like, you know, digital media and, yeah, yeah. you know. And he's like, it really takes them five years to get their feet under them, mm-hmm. right? He's like, it would be great if when they graduated from your program, they were five years ahead, yes. right? That they had um, experience in um, conceiving, articulating, and executing projects, that they were, um, that they could lead projects and be good team members in projects, that they um, uh, understood how to complete uh, projects, that they were self directed learners, because obviously, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, they knew how to ship. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, that's a big part of our program that's is shipping. That's really interesting. <laughs> you know, ship, shipping a game, right? Te- teaching people how to ship. That's an important skill. Sometimes I wonder yeah. whether I ever learned that one. That's a, <laughs> that's a hard one. <laughs> you always, there's you know, always more that you want to add, right? That's really well, that, interesting. Well, that, I mean, isn't there always? I was well, literally always. just yesterday thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could add this one? <laughs> no, 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 no. Hands off. <laughs> pencils down. <laughs> pencils down. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can we uh, wrap up by talking a little bit about the game's publishing side of things? Sure, sure. So, so um, yeah, I mean, what is USC Games Publishing? How does that work? When was that born? What's its grit? What's its mandate? Yes. <clears throat> so USC Games Publishing is an idea that I had um, uh, to make a publishing label within our program that was sort of like, um, I'm just going to say like, you know, like MIT publishing or, you know, sure. like how, how um, a lot of academic institutions have uh, book publishing labels where they will curate and publish, uh, um, you know, really interesting writings that I, might not I, I go to like a random house. I, my, my mother spent her entire career working for University Press. Uh, there you go. U of T yeah. and then McGill Queens. And so I, you know, spent my life growing up in and around so academic you get press. It. Yeah. You get it. And, you know, look, let's be honest. It's not about making money, no. right? <laughs> but it's, The 10 it's a copies co- <laughs> of the book they printed and distributed are not going to make a lot of money. No, but... But what? But but here's the thing that's really interesting about university presses. Um, first of all, they they really are focused on quality, yes. right? They're really interested on pushing the boundaries and, and producing quality and um, things that would not be valued outside of of say a university press. Um, they also count for tenure. Mm-hmm. Um, and as as games programs grow up. Um, and search for ways to um, measure. Mm-hmm. Your, you know, we're talking about this before to measure the success of, say, a uh, a, a game designer in academia. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the ways that you you know sort of uh, talk about your your work is has it been published? Um, was it peer reviewed, etc. Right. So these were sort of some of the goals um, was to build almost a cultural platform uh, for for games and. Um, the so we went out and secured uh publishing uh partnerships uh with uh PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, Apple, etc. And um so we have essentially a, a path mm-hmm. to bring games through to any or all of those platforms. Um and the first set of three games that we announced uh, have been launched. Uh, so that was Peter Brinson and Krosh Valanajad's um, The Cat and the Coup, okay. which is uh, a game about the uh, last uh, democratically elected leader of Iran. Um, and uh, you play as uh, Mohammed Mossadegh. Uh, uh, you, you, you play as his cat. Um, and you are met- the, the cat is a metaphor for Western sort of interference. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so the only action you can take in the game is you, as a cat, you can meddle. 
um, uh, and knock things <laughs> over and, and, and affect the balance, uh, of power, et cetera. Nudge. Um, you can nudge. Just you gently can nudge. nudge. And push things off. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just push it off the table and see if it hits the ground and smashes. Exactly. It sounds it like a exactly. cat. It's a great, it's a great little game and it's a beaut and it's actually very beautiful. It's, uh, um, done in the style of sort of, uh, Persian, uh, miniatures. Okay. Uh, and it's like this, it's like this one painting and you're actually, as the levels are kind of moving down this painting and then moving back up again. It's very, very, very beautiful. Um, and so that was, um, one of our first releases. And then, uh, another one was, uh, the Night Journey, which was um, a game that I made in collaboration with the uh, artist Bill Viola, okay. and Bill is a, a very, very a worldwide uh, known media artist. He's he was one of the first uh, recognized video artists, so making mm -hmm. art using the video sure. um, format. Uh, and and uh, so I worked with Bill um, for for a number of years to create this game, which is something like. Uh, it you know its its goal uh, was to create experience around the journey to spiritual enlightenment. Okay. Uh, so not not a big goal at all. Um, uh, but so that's I available. brushed my teeth this morning. That's a thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Bucket thing. list check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make game about the journey to spiritual enlightenment. Yeah, you win. Check. Yours is better. <laughs> uh, so we made that and. Um, uh, you know, it's still, it's on exhibit all around the world, but it's also available on PlayStation. Okay. And, um, um, we also publish it uh, via itch. Okay. Um, and then the, the last one is, uh, Walden, a game, which is also my game. So I don't want you to think like this is just for me because we're, <laughs> this we're is also, like a self -publishing one, label. <laughs> one of the things is uh, I was, Peter and I were the guinea pigs in many sure. ways. Well, yeah, you need to uh, you need yeah. to show other people, look, this thing works, and so you're leading by example. I get it. And we also need to build um, competency up in our lab so that you know we now have a team of people who can do the pipeline. Yeah, right. And so, know how to yeah push yeah, to these different and platforms and exactly. Yeah. And and so so Walden a game uh, is a game where you play as Henry David Thoreau, and it's a six hour long open world game where you play this adventure of going down to the woods, living simply in nature, and trying to balance uh, these sort of basic survival tasks um, with this search for inspiration and connection to, to nature. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that is, uh, has shipped now on Itch and Steam and uh, PlayStation. And um, so this recording will come out later, but it's currently in pre-order on Xbox and will launch... Uh, uh, July second oh, awesome. on Xbox okay. world, worldwide. So it'll it'll um, so be available actually, for sure. Yeah. When yeah, and that's our first worldwide launch. So that's again, awesome. we're learning as we go, and um, uh, that's our that's our first worldwide launch. But the other ones have been in North America, um, and then you know we're talking uh, w with some other folks, uh, specifically students. I want to bring some more student games. Uh, one of the earliest games that I didn't mention, I should have mentioned uh, with was Shambara, which was mm -hmm. a student game that actually won uh, a student BAFTA. Um, and uh, that was actually the first game we published on PlayStation. Mm -hmm. um, and Shambara was a kind of beautiful ninja fighting game, completely in black and white. And oh, the characters are completely in black and white. And so you can hide in the shadows and in the light, <laughs> of course. Yes, uh, you can. You can see it immediately. Of course, yeah. of course. I don't. Yeah. I don't even have to look it up. I see it right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting uh, to me that you you just going back to your personal journey. In some ways, there's almost this full circle, right? Where you you started out in industry, you went to academia, and now that there's this publishing <laughs> platform. You're basically back into industry trying to relearn the modern way of publishing and distributing in this purely digital era. I can't help myself. You can't help I it. can't <laughs> help myself, Ben. I want people to play games. And that and that is if that is if there is a critique that I could uh, you know, bring, uh, I would say that one of the things I found immediately when I came to academia is that people were not finishing their games yes. and they and they had very small expectations about how many people were going to play them. Yeah. And I guess I want to experiment and I want to do the wacky, mm -hmm. but I also, but you also want people have to play this and finish. deep need to get it out to the, 
I, I want that to have influence. I want mm-hmm. that to get out to a public, right? And one of the ways I do it is through teaching. Mm-hmm. I think that one person's process can only go so far. But if I train mm-hmm. thousands of kids in, in this play-centric process, they can have an influence, right? The same with these games. If we just make the games and we all play them and we're like, yay, that was so fun. That's great. We've influenced each other. But I want them to get out there, right? And that's why we've always focused on completing our games, going all the way back to cloud. Um, we've always focused on polishing and completing and 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 also you know user testing them so really yep. working to to make sure that that user experience is is has been nailed hmm. you know that's amazing i mean i've this has been a really great chat i um frankly and i i mean this very sincerely i learned a ton because <laughs> your world is not a world that i have been very close to and i've been working in games for 20 some years and just, I didn't go to school in, 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 in game development. And I, you know, hired maybe a handful of people out of, you know, full sale or something like that in my time. But still, the majority of the people that I hired probably didn't graduate from professional, you know, from curriculum programs. So it's a world that I, I only have a sort of surface level um, knowledge of. And I think it's so interesting to see how, um, Programs like USC absolutely have either directly or indirectly shaped the industry, both in terms of the technologies, the developers, consumer demand, platforms, what platforms are looking for. I mean, huge, measurable, absolutely distinct impact on the industry. And yet, people like me know so little about it, right? And so clearly, there's still a lot of, I don't know, room for growth. Outreach. Yeah, There's outreach. a lot of outreach to I do. Love outreach. So thank you. I think thank you for I, I, educating me, and hopefully, at least one other person will have listened to this podcast and gone, <laughs> "Oh my gosh, I just learned so much about why USC's Innovation Lab matters. I need to something pay attention." That's, or that's awesome. And you know, if uh, if folks are you know interested in seeing games, uh, one of the things we've done, and a lot of programs have done, we put our final end of year show online. Yes, yeah, you so mentioned this. So the uscgamesexpo.com, yeah. uh, I believe that the the recording is up there. So lots of amazing games to awesome. uh, to check out. Well, I now have my summer planned. Thanks. I know <laughs> I know all <laughs> the games I have to play this summer. Fantastic. Um, Tracy, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to chat with me today, sharing your history, sharing your, your, your lessons and learnings and, and your passion and your enthusiasm for this space. I found it inspiring. Hopefully the people listening did as well. Um, and uh, I wish you a fantastic summer. Thank you. You too. Have a great break when you go. I will. I'll enjoy it. Thanks so much to Tracy for joining uh, me today on uh, another episode of the Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. And if you did, please don't hesitate to get in touch. I can be reached on Twitter at M-O-O-K. That's MOOC. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on email. I shouldn't be hard to find. Uh, Love to hear from you. What kinds of conversations did you like? What kinds of guests are you interested in hearing more from? What kinds of subjects would you like me to dig deeper into? All of that feedback is super useful and precious for me as we plan out, hopefully, season two, the second year of interviews and conversations. So please don't hesitate to reach out. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a wonderful summer. Bye.